hey, it's Ben Greenfield. I recently had a bunch of ripped meathead freaks over to my recording studio in my basement, and I'm about to reveal to you via audio the chaos that ensued. But should you actually want to listen to something uh, slightly longer via audio, or perhaps even more engaging than what you're about to hear, not that what you're about to hear is bad, I'm making it sound bad, it's not, Um, you should check out Audible. I don't know if you knew this, but I've got 19 hours and 48 minutes of my complete Beyond Training book on Audible. I, I think that would allow you to drive at least halfway across the United States of America listening to me and my annoying voice in your car talking about um, everything, performance plateaus and brain fog and gas and bloating and libido and anti-aging and biohacking. It's about 500 pages jam-packed with content that I read to you. Well, you can get that over at Audible, because Audible, for everybody listening into this show, has a 30-day trial that lets you get that book or any other book that you want, your first audiobook, for free. You go to audible.com slash fitness to get a free 30-day trial and audiobook, and they have a huge selection. I mean, literally, like hundreds of thousands of books, literally. See what I did there? Um, Because it's lit. Uh, Anyways, um, you just download the books or your shows to your mobile device and you listen while the, while the car flies by or wherever else you happen to be on a gridlocked freeway. Um, Audible audiobooks, you can get lost in them. So check it out, audible.com slash fitness. Um, this podcast is also brought to you by Harry's and Harry's has this cool new free kit that they'll send to your house. What is Harry's? Harry's creates these amazing razors. Like their five blade razor has a soft flex hinge for a comfortable glide. Do you like how my voice gets soft when I start describing their features? A, uh, a, a trimmer blade for hard to reach places, a lubricating strip, and a, a textured handle for more control when your razor handle is wet. If you're one of those people that shaves in the shower, like my wife who steals my Harry's razor and shaves her legs in the shower, not that I care, baby, I still love you. I'm just saying. Anyways, though, so here's the deal with Harry's. They have made it so you can get this stuff for free. It's a free trial set is what they call it. You get the razor. You get what's called their five-blade cartridge and their shaving gel, which is actually this really good foaming shave gel that is good for your skin. It's got aloe in it and cucumber. So rather than like chopping up cucumber and smearing it on your face like you were just about to do, you can instead use the the Harry's foaming shave gel and save yourself a cucumber. So you get this free shaving trial when you sign up for any shaving plan on their website. You do pay shipping, but that's it. Nada, zippo, zilch, aside from shipping. So you enter code BEN at harrys.com, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com, and enter code BEN at checkout to get your free trial set and your post-shave balm, which you're going to throw in too. That's a new one. They're actually going to include, I guess, two things. Not only your your cream that you could shave with or your gel, rather, uh, along with the razor and the five-blade cartridge, but then your post-shave balm everything you need for a sexy, smooth face. Uh, Finally, this podcast is brought to you by, um, well, let me tell you this. My wife, I've mentioned her twice already. It's crazy. She's getting a lot of cameos on this podcast episode. She's going to have to cut me a check. Um, She got sick. I was gone and she got sick and I got home and she had the stomach flu and I'm about to go hunting up in Canada for a week and I do not want to go hunting while I'm throwing up my insides. So not only did I not go into my bedroom, I slipped into the guest room and I slept there. I know. It's bad. I should have gone in there and snuggled up to my wife, but I didn't because I knew she was she was pukey. Um, but I also slammed two of these chaga elixirs this morning. So these chaga elixirs, I don't know if you know about chaga, but it's uh, able to fight infections and bacteria and colds and viruses and things that might make you poo or throw up a little funny. And you just take these packets and you put them in coffee or tea or anything else that you want. And it's a dual extract, meaning that they, they get the uh, water soluble components and then also the fat soluble components squeezed into this tiny little green packet and they throw like some eleuthero and rose hips in there for vitamin c little filled mint for some flavor and uh, it's really good stuff so c-h-a-g-a it's this big black mushroom that grows on birch trees um you get 15 percent off of that or any of the other mushrooms from four sigmatic foods when you go to four sigmatic.com slash greenfield that's f-o-u-r sigmatic.com slash greenfield and 
you use 15% code GREENFILLED. That'll get you everything you need to not be a sad-faced, pukey person. So check it all out. The Audible book, the razors, the chaga mushroom extract, and also check this out, an amazing interview with the dudes from Mind Pump. In this episode of the Ben Group of Fitness Show... One group of people, I had them do squats very heavily, and then the following days, I had them walk and stretch and do light body weight lunges. And the other group of people, they hammered their legs and then they just bed rest for the rest of the week. Just lay in bed and don't move. The people on bed rest would lose muscle. They'd lose muscle and strength within a five day, seven day period, even shorter. It just changed my relationship with carbohydrates and with fats. So for so many years as trainers, I mean, we've demonized fat. And I mean, I remember telling clients like, oh, don't, don't even try and get fat in your diet. You know, when I first started 15 years ago. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is... Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed, mobility, balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place. Right here, right now. On the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey, what's up? It's Ben Greenfield. And last night in the wee hours of the evening, four guys from San Jose descended upon my home for a homemade meal full of chicken and organic wine and tomatillos and buckwheat pancakes and a general good time all around. And then they came back this morning and we threw down a relatively epic podcast and a podcast that you're about to listen to. These are the guys from what is called the Mind Pump Media Podcast and the Mind Pump website, which we'll talk a little bit more about during the episode. It's not often that I have four people on the podcast simultaneously, so I may leave it up slightly to you to be able to differentiate between all the voices that you're going to hear. But either way, we're going to talk about what they specialize in, which is pulling back the curtain on mythology and snake oil and pseudoscience that pervades the fitness industry. And instead, we delve into science backed solutions that specifically focus on what these guys specialize in, which is muscle building and fat loss combined with health. So if you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash mind pump, I've got these guys full bios, what they look like. They are pretty impressive physical specimens as well as more about how you can tap into the goodness that is mind pump. We talk about everything on this show from how to do anabolic triggering sessions to why bodybuilders are disappearing to Kuwait and somehow coming back just a couple months later with 20 pounds of extra muscle to underground muscle building and anabolic supplements like SARMs and Clomid and injectable testosterone, why you probably need far less protein than you think, the biggest myths in the fitness industry, and a lot more. So I think you're going to dig this one. Hey folks, what's up? It's Ben from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Back once again in a very unique situation. My house has actually been taken over by a bunch of swole guys from San Jose, <laughs> the dudes from the Mind Pump podcast. Yeah. Uh, we we had dinner last night, first of all. You, you guys showed up and I put you right to work. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> yes. so- so the strange, I noticed that. I, I got to tell your audience how, how this all went down. So we show up and uh, I'm sure they know this about you, but uh, barefoot uh, outside. It's nighttime, and he mm. has this bale hay. Yeah, with him. yeah. The first time. Well, he's well, what was that all about? Hey guys, carry some hay yeah. with me. Well, I'm you, like, he's you guys us. were tardy. Like it was a test. <laughs> you guys were tardy for dinner, so I started taking care of that. I, I had to finish off my honeydew list and take care of the hay. And, oh, I see. And uh, if you're listening in and you haven't you haven't moved around hay before, I was actually telling you guys this story last night. So I I got my ass kicked in the recent train to hunt competition, which is basically like obstacle racing with with weapons and and there's a lot of sandbag carries and a lot of un 
unwieldy, like 100, 150 pound backpacks that you're that you're hoisting around. And I, I asked the guy uh, who who won it. I'm actually trying to get on the podcast, like what his go to workout was. And he's like, I drive around to farmers fields and and bale hay, yeah. basically get <laughs> paid to work out doing clean and jerks for two hours. Bail and hay. So you're just doing us a favor. That's what that was. Just doing you guys a favor. (laughs) I appreciate the workout. Yeah. yeah. Getting getting you ready for dinner. It was nice. (laughs) I feel like that's, I feel like it was a test. I think it was like, you know, I got to see if these guys are going to come to my house, going to have dinner with my family and my wife. We're going to do a podcast together. We're going to see if they have real, real world strength, you know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Functional strength. We're not just like balloons. We could have done concentration curls. I I was just going to say, I was fatigued because I had done those earlier. I've done some donkey kickbacks too. Oh, yeah. For sure. I was actually, I was actually impressed with Sal's ability. To, to to carry the the, the bell of hay there. I know I knew yeah. Justin would be fine. Oh, yeah, I did that for king. a good portion of my life. Well, but. I mean, considering I'm stronger than you guys, I'm sure. <laughs> considering uh, you don't do any manual labor, yeah, that's <laughs> that's what we were considering. I think functionally, one one of the strongest times I've, I've ever had in my life, and in, in terms of my own strength, was in college when I was painting and baling hay and uh, playing water polo. Those were the, of course. The, those three things all put together. Oh God! Imagine that potent mix. Well, well you, someone should create a DVD: the water, <laughs> water polo, hay baling, <laughs> painting. We might DVD. have our next program. Interesting. That's, that's how we'll get yeah. people to yeah. fix up our new studio and paint it and stuff. We'll just tell them it's <laughs> part of the workout. It's yeah. it's it, it's because of the 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 long term frequent use of your body. I mean, when you're working, you were working for hours during the day. When we work out, it's an hour. Yeah, that's the difference. Well, and it's it's kind of this yeah. moderate intensity activity that we. People just don't consider a workout, but they don't realize how uh, effective it can be at well. This is some, something that we we talk a lot about is uh, you know frequency over intensity intensity and how important that is. You know, and that's uh, you, when you do something like that day in day out. I mean, Sal talks about like a look at a mailman's calves. You know, things like that. It's not like the guys over there doing calf raises every day. Like he's in there stimulating his calves though, all day long, walking around. The same thing goes for like God, if someone who's doing water polo. Talk about a sport where. You got to oh, have yeah. some serious strength to keep yourself above water. Yeah, Constant that's, resistance. That's one of the things I tell people with water polo is it, it keeps you fit because if you don't stop moving, you die. Yeah. It's one of it's you one literally of sports <laughs> where if you don't stop that egg beater kick, which is a, it's a it's a great. And I I still do that. Like with if I'm at a hotel with a crappy pool, I'll use my old school tricks from water polo where I'll do the egg beater kick hardcore for like a minute. Then you get out and do push ups, jump back in, do a sprint, and there's there's all sorts of of cool things you can do without necessarily having to. You know, like Laird Hamilton, throw throw dumbbells into a pool and walk back and forth under <laughs> right. the water. Oh, that, yeah. you, that's got to be some incredible hip mobility. I didn't even think of that. Egg beater uh, movements mm-hmm. in the pool is oh. a fantastic hip mobility movement. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, you, if your lateral or medial meniscus are, are effed up, it's also probably not a good to, yeah. to destroy your knees. Yeah. But but it, but it is it is good fitness. Now, one of the things that you guys brought up is we were, we were punishing chicken and, and uh, buckwheat wraps last <laughs> night. My, my wife provided us hungry. with. It was, it was a good meal. We had, we, had, yeah. we had some wine. Phenomenal, some, phenomenal meal. I had a cheeseburger yeah. afterwards. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, I hope these guys don't leave and have to go to, to McDonald's. No, not and, at all. And Tomatillo's. Tomatillo's. Yeah. Delicious. Uh, oh, yeah. That was excellent. Treat. The, that was a treat. The next superfood. If you guys are listening in, <laughs> yes, we, we are going to create a, a gently dried green superfood powder made of, of tomatillos, but we, we sprinkle tomatillos with like a, a an Aztec salt. And if you haven't had tomatillos before, uh, th- this is a new addition to my wife's garden that she's growing. Just just uh, hunt them down, find one, and eat it. It's like a, I mean, what do you guys think? It's like a sweet tomato. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't even taste like a tomato to me. It no. actually had like an, a- it almost tasted like an apple. Yeah, it's got like a crisp taste of an apple. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I thought right. it tasted like, like a green apple. It had like a right. really sweet tell, taste. Tell me it. about this Aztec one, salt. One of those hybrid genetically modified foods that's going to give us cancer. <laughs> yes. yes. Tell me, don't tell don't me about that. the Aztec salt. I've never had Aztec salt before. Uh, Aztec salt is harvested sustainably on the Mexican coast. And by sustainably, I'm guessing that means it's not eight-year-old Mexican children harvesting it, but mm. actual full-grown Mexican adults getting mm-hmm. paid some kind of a wage. Got it. That's just the picture I create in my own head. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, <laughs> it makes you but, feel better when yeah, you sprinkle it on your... <laughs> um, you know, as, as you guys know, you know, sodium chloride, and, and I don't have to tell most of our listeners this, it's not doing your body the most favors. It's usually aluminum mm-hmm. caked. The extraction methods are harsh. The solvent methods are harsh. And all you get... Usually is sodium unopposed with many of the other, mm-hmm. you know, 72 plus minerals that you'd typically get from a good salt, like a Himalayan salt mm. or, or one of my other favorites, the, the black salt that you get from the Kona coast. That's another really I good I just one. bought some of that. 
I'm my, a my favorite fiend. salt is the, it's the salt harvested from the tears of Tibetan monks who uh, mm-hmm. meditated for years. Mm-hmm. It's very yes. pure. You let it dry it, out. Yeah. For, yeah. Yes. It's very anabolic. Two days. Preferably alternative lifestyle, one-armed Tibetan monks. <laughs> so that you just you fire on all cylinders. <laughs> And uh, the, the Aztec salt is, it's a very clumpy, you guys probably know this, is some people even put it in like a salt grinder to grind it, but mm. I like it clumpy. I like to be able to chew my salt. I'm the same way. And what I do is I, I travel with this everywhere. I get strange looks at restaurants, but I'll pull it out and just sprinkle it on anything and it enhances the flavor profile of just about anything that you put it on, but it also provides you with, uh, with minerals, you know, and, and, you know, for a guy like me who's working out a lot with the adrenal glands being a storehouse of minerals and, you know, needing to retain water well and needing all the other things that minerals do for me. That's, that's one of my go-to sources. And it's a heck of a lot more tasty than like one of these trace liquid mineral it, droppers. Where do you bottles. find, where do you find it? I order it. Yeah. You I, order. I, it's not something and, you can pick up at Safeway. Uh, I don't think you can find it at Safeway. Yeah, I've seen no, it it's not as the, harsh the, as regular uh, salt. It, the, it was very tasty. It didn't have that bite that regular salt mm-hmm. does, probably because it's lower in sodium. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it, but it's a really great flavor profile. Plus, it's Aztec. You can't go wrong with something that has the badass <laughs> title. <Yeah. Aztec>. Anything <laughs> it's ancient, you, man. we could we could do Aztec tomatillos. You could have Aztec milk. Aztec ketchup, anything that's Aztec, it Sounds automatically. Tough. This automatically is brilliant. Like, I think we should all collaborate and make an Aztec yeah. warrior workout. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. <laughs> if you don't do the workout, then you get sacrificed. Run some pyramids or die. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to ask you guys about something that came up during dinner last night. Because, yes. and, and honestly, I know for those of you listening in, when there's four people talking, it's hard to tell who's who, but uh, Adam here is the, the house bodybuilder, right? <laughs> the house He's bodybuilder. the the husky voice. Knows, <laughs> knows a lot about getting swole. Yes, the husky voice. And Adam, we were talking a little bit about things like like underground things that, that are coming up now that I get a lot of questions about, right? Like HGH frags and peptides and SARMs and a lot of these newer um, muscle gain slash fat loss slash growth hormone increasing type of compounds that people are now turning to as an alternative to say, uh, amino acids and creatine and fish oil and all the all the old boring proven stuff. Well, uh, and and you mentioned that guys are now going to Kuwait, yeah, and coming back swole. Tell me about this. Yeah, and and this is completely speculation on our part because I have I have no proof, but it's pretty crazy when you see. And there's there's been a handful, you know, I'd say about five or seven professional bodybuilders that I know that have gone over there, and these are guys that have been competing for. 10, 15 years or life, you know, at that point, and you know that, you know, every one pound of muscle you add is a victory at that point, right? They're taking already tons of gear and they're Cause doing- you've, you've put on so much muscle by that point that, that even just getting tiny, tiny increases in muscle is considered a win. Yeah, exactly. Because you've, I mean, you've already, not only have you reached your genetic potential, but you've also done everything you can almost chemically to enhance that, you know, when you see guys, you know, add even the smallest amount of muscle at that level, you're extremely impressed. And we're, we're seeing these guys right now that are going over there and they're coming back and, and they're not spending more than a couple months there. I mean, I'm talking, you know, 60 to 90 days and they're back and they're, they look like they've added 20, 30 pounds Something crazy is going of on. lean yeah. mass to their body. Something crazy is going on quite. It's, I don't think I, I would, I mean, I mean, again, this is pure speculation, but I highly doubt that they've, that they're, it's, it's having anything to do with hormones because they maxed out. I mean, they're, they're, these guys at this level are using testosterone grams of grams yeah. a week growth hormone they're using insulin they're using you know igf1 and all these different compounds that, that they've been using now since the the 90s at high doses right and these guys are already walking around 280 pounds i mean shredded massive guys they haven't added muscle in the last five years because they've hit that limit right then they go over there and two three months later they come back and like what just happened what, what i don't do you, think what it's do you, th- what do you guys think what do you th- I, what do you think I, my money is on i because we know the science on myostatin inhibition is developing right you know you, you start he, to, he thinks that i don't know if we're yeah. there yet you know i'm not sure if we're there to it but seeing pictures of the cows that uh, yeah so that so myostatin backing this up a little bit like when, when my myostatin would be a specific uh gene is it a gene or an enzyme Myostatin is a protein that, um, when it's uh, elevated, it inhibits uh, muscle growth. It's a it's a muscle growth controller. And when they do studies on animals, well, they'll genetically, you know, modify the animal so that it has. Uh, it works like a safety mechanism for us as humans. Well, right? it uh, stops us from continuing to build and build and build and build. There's actually an animal that naturally has very low or defunct myostatin. It's the Belgian uh, blue bull, and it's been bred this way. They didn't know they bred it this way, and had these extremely muscular. Bowls, and if you look them up online, 
Uh, they look freaky. They look crazy. So it's um, a, it's a, it's a Myostatin knockout bowl. It's yeah. basically yes. And People could literally Google Myostatin dog, Myostatin bowl, and you'll just see crazy. I'll, so I'll, I'll find a picture. By the by the way, if you guys are listening in, um, I'll put the show notes at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash mind pump. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash mind pump, and I'll be sure and put a, a swole bowl mm. in yes. there for you to look at. So what they when they do these studies on animals, they'll take mice and they'll, you know, they'll take one and switch off their myostatin gene and leave the other one normal or whatever. Here's the crazy thing. They don't exercise anymore. They don't feed them any differently, and they just build muscle, like ridiculous amounts of muscle. The the kind of muscle that you would expect on an animal that was given high doses of, you know, androgens and put through exercise and fed differently. Very crazy stuff. That's well, like the next generation. There has to be a biological trade off to that, though. Like, I would, like I would a, imagine. Oh, do these animals get cancer? I haven't read anything about that yet. Um, I don't think they quite understand the other functions of myostatin besides, like you're saying. I mean, turn that off. What could it possibly? I think anything do? I've read is it's more like the, their heart giving out to be able to handle all that, right? Mm. To be able to, to move that. We just you weren't made to. Does, have does the heart give out or does it get hypertrophic? Well, it's like, yeah. It's, I don't know. You know, that's a great question. It is a great question. There's not a lot of studies on it, and that's why it's and that's why I don't know. You know, Sal says that that was his theory on that's what they're doing over there. I don't know. Yeah. You know, for sure, if that's Pure it. Speculation. But, you mean you mean in Kuwait? Yes. Yeah. You know, because but it, I, I tell you what, and you know this, you were in bodybuilding. That you know, if there is anybody that's doing the crazy shit and that's really you know going after the the out, way out there, and t- I mean bodybuilders, they've been doing it forever. You know, they pioneered a lot of stuff that we we have now. A lot of people are afraid to take that next step, and that's one of the things that we do appreciate about them. You know, a lot of people talk trash at oh, all; they're a bunch of steroid freaks and this and that. But a lot of these guys are you know kind of like bro scientist a little bit you know they go in and they're playing with these things and it's all right some of the most intelligent writings on the entire internet are on bodybuilding forums mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. well they're, they're, proceed they're, with caution i i would say uh for mm. knowledge on using um you know hormones uh they're right up there with the soviet you know coaches that you know coach the athletes i mean yeah the, the timing and the doses and what to use when and how to use this to prevent you know your estrogen levels from going to a high and all this other stuff i want to ask you a little bit about some of the some of these like lesser known techniques for for muscle gain mm-hmm. um and but by the way that that photograph behind me that you guys can see here in my office that's me bodybuilding and i i was completely natural and extremely uh, impressive by, by natural i mean and i was telling you guys this last night literally tuna fish cans mm. with ketchup and relish that actually doesn't count because tuna fish is extremely anabolic they found so <laughs> it's, a, it's the mercury <laughs> yeah the mercury Cheating. just pumps you up yeah <laughs> uh but but yeah i mean i i eventually got a sponsorship with uh with abb i don't even know if they're around anywhere but they, they, they made these these protein cans right like the, the protein would come to you in, in like a soda can right uh-huh. you just pop it open and drink it i remember it's full of Full Super of, high quality yeah, thermostats. Tasted and all awful that. too. BPA and other you're going to shit out a straw components that you know, <laughs> Lord knows what. You know, the, the ingredient label takes up half the can, which is always a warning sign. But, <laughs> yeah, right. But that that was that was my go to was ABB bodybuilding shakes and tuna with ketchup. Oh, I was right with yeah. you, man. I, I, I remember drinking horrible. horrible. You guys remember Blue Thunder? I do. It was it was it was literally a bottle of everything. Like you looked at the ingredients, you're like, oh, it's got smilax. Oh, it's got mm. salt palmetto. Oh, ABB got- ABB had right. one too, and I forgot the name of it, but it was a it had like it was the everything. Did they make the speed stack? Was yeah. that ABB? Yeah, yeah that was yeah. ABB. Okay, because that's my favorite those. thing of all time. This guy I just got me remember on the those. Choc- chocolate protein shakes. That and, and then my other go to is Redline. Yeah, which yeah. is like the pre workout. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you ever inject that? Another one that makes you sweat. Uh, <laughs> you no, no. But but actually, the, the only thing that I, that I have much experience injecting uh, that that I'm that I'm using now, like I have a bum ankle right now for my Peptides. last Spartan race. I is, saw you is, had a little uh, bit of swollen. Swell yeah. There. So and I, I was actually running the, when you guys showed up this morning. I was running the the, uh, the Mark Pro Electro Stim on it. Uh, j- just to, to pump out some of the inflammation, mm-hmm. but I've been injecting um, a, a fragment called or a peptide called BPC one fifty seven into it, mm-hmm. which is which is just basically like a, a a healing peptide that initiates that inflammatory cascade. They isolate it from gastric juices because that's where you'll find it in in humans, where it can be used to heal gastric mucosa, for example. And that's actually you can take an insulin syringe and you can draw a BPC-157 back into it and spray it into your mouth to help with with healing of gastric Interesting. mucosa. Mm. Uh, but, but there are a lot of these things now that I'm seeing uh, pop up on the internet so that, that might be old news in the bodybuilding world, but that I'd like to get kind of your, your guys' opinion on as far as like 
you know, obviously there are things like I mentioned, like creatine and fish oil and, and a good high quality protein that can help people with something like uh, putting on muscle. Mm-hmm. But as far as these more more underground things, you know, like like SARMs, for example, is something I recently touched on on a blog post mm-hmm. and uh, peptides or uh, or uh, growth hormone fragments. Are there things that you think folks could be using should be using don't know about or that would be extremely efficacious for the people listening in that may want to put on muscle and add things into like well we we talk we talk down a lot about sarms just because there's just not a lot of not a lot of good studies yet you know it's Mm -hmm. that's kind of like buyer beware you know if you're gonna go i mean and we when you've seen stuff i mean people are you know there's the what is the latest one we just talked about one recently well you know here's i mean here's the thing with a lot of these these so yes bodybuilders have been messing with sarms now for at least is it for uh, maybe five years, and, and they're all available and, as research chemicals. By the way, yeah. they're not legal. Right, for human you, you have to buy them from from like Peptide Warehouse or right. Blue Sky Peptides or, or one of these other websites. Exactly. But, but so so SARMs, for example, explain what it is and what it would do for someone, and and, and why you do or you do not like it. Well, a SARM is a uh, SARM stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator. So it's it, it attaches to the uh, androgen receptor, and uh, the goal of a SARM is to uh, elicit uh, the positive effects from those receptors and not so many of the negative effects. So some of the problems with taking testosterone, for example, is you get anabolic effects, but you also get androgenic effects, which are the masculinizing effects or the acne or you know the hair loss and those kinds of things, the undesirable effects of uh, anabolic steroids. SARMs are supposed to uh, you know kind of mitigate that a little bit. You're not going to get some of those negative effects. Um, it supposedly at the right doses won't uh, affect uh, your own hormone levels, although they're finding at high doses, or at least the doses that people are using, you know, the, the, on the gray market, that they are getting some shutdown of uh, testosterone. But um, the drugs themselves are being studied for, you know, osteoporosis, uh, for male, you know, what do they call it? andropause, um, you know, just right. as an alternative to testosterone and testosterone derivatives. The problem that we have, and we've talked about SARMs uh, a few times now on the show. The problem that we have is with testosterone, we have a really good we idea. We know so much more we, about that. We know what it does and what it doesn't do. We know what your side effects are going to be. We know uh, what the doses you know you can take. We know um, you know where you can get it from, especially if you get a prescription. It's you know with SARMs, we don't quite know all of the effects it has, and if there's any long term effects and it's still undergoing you know testing at the moment but if you go on the forums you can read about some weird side effects like i don't i think s4 sarm i think it's called s4 people are like complaining about like vision changes you know like they'll they'll they'll, like there'll be a yellow tint to everything that they look at or or it'll change the their 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 ability to see at night which is a little weird (laughs) it's a little you know what i mean it's like take some steroids kind of cool yeah (laughs) turn into a save money on blue light blocking glasses (laughs) (laughs) i just feel like if you're if you're somebody who's considering going that direction you know and i'm not i'm not one to advocate taking you know steroids and but if you're going to go mess with something that i feel like you're safer going in a direction where we know more you know and it's it's kind of that gray area right now we're still learning so much about it you know so. what would be a direction where we know more what do you mean well like as far like t- like sal was saying like testosterone like we know we know more about testosterone how that affects you i mean there's hormone but you can go see a doctor now and actually get it prescribed to you if your levels are lower than normal and yeah. they can monitor your blood and see that sarms like i've just i've always been afraid to mess with something like that i'm afraid to mess with something that it just hasn't been studied for a very long time i'm not quite that risk i'm not that quite risk. i don't care that much about getting the extra edge or performance from something that when i still feel like there's so many other things that we can be getting better at like you're a perfect example of somebody who i think is neat to see like mess with all the different little tiny things to just get better performance better sleep but that's because you're doing all the the big pieces first. Mm. You know, you got people that are taking SARMs or taking steroids or taking You mean the, the, the goat milk and the yeah. tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But no, day. but you I mean, even the way you treat your sleep and the, the lights in your house, and there's so many other things that are natural, that are safe, that are gonna help you first. And I feel like that's the order of operation that we should all strive for first before we add like this next bit of performance or yeah, edge. you know that's, what I'm that's not sexy it, if, you're yeah, right sure. you're, you're right sexy. but you're yeah. also i mean you know you're also uh, you know you're a biohacker right this is something you really enjoy um i think uh you know experimenting on yourself is excellent i i think uh that's if you're gonna do look i, I believe everybody should be able to do what they want to their body they own it um you're also very educated and 
Um, so this is something you do for yourself to you know to see what the effects are, so you can report on them, which I think is actually quite responsible. You have an audience that's going to listen to you more than they're going to listen to some other person. Um, but to the average person, you know, average listener that you know, like on our show and stuff. I mean, we're always like, look, if you're going to do anything that's out, that's fringe, that's different, that has nothing to do with food or exercise or water or sleep, um, and you want to inject yourself with something. Yeah. Go to the doctor, get prescription testosterone. We know what it does. It'll definitely build muscle. You'll definitely have increased libido. You'll definitely get some of the, you'll get maybe some negatives too, but we know what they are. Um, but some of these like uh, research chemicals, it's crazy. You can go on these sites, these research chemical sites, and you can get your hands on all kinds of stuff. You yeah. can get your hands on, uh, you know, uh, Nolvidex and Clomid and, you know, all these estrogen mm-hmm. blockers and you can get, you know, Arimidex and all these drugs that are normally, you know, scheduled uh, substances. Clomid is another one that you hear a lot about. Can you explain what what Clomid is? Because it what wasn't there a UFC fighter that recently got got banned? John from Jones. Using John Jones Clomid? Yeah. Why would he have been using that? And 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 what what is it about Clomid that would allow you to have some kind of a performance enhancing? So effect? Clomid and Nolvidex are both SERMs. Uh, so we had a, we just talked about SARMs, right? Selective androgen receptor modulators. Okay. A SERM is an estrogen receptor modulator. So very similar. It attaches to the estrogen receptor, and the goal of SERMs is to block the estrogen receptor. Just okay. block it and try not to activate it. And so, so more than so, likely, so he keep, wasn't he keep, wasn't taking it from, me from getting man boobs and weepy during chicken. Yes, so. exactly. And, to, to prevent the the uh, the negative effects of all this excess testosterone that might be building up. However, the way that I would speculate that he used it because they test um, they're tested for steroids in the UFC. However, if you take testosterone and you get off in time, by the time they test you, you'll be you'll you'll show up okay. Your testosterone levels right. will be back to normal. However, to get your testosterone levels back to normal can take some time after going off, you know, large doses of uh, you know uh, testosterone. And so, one of the ways you can speed up the process is by using a serum like uh, Clomid, which tricks the body into re- into producing more testosterone quicker. Now, a healthy man taking Clomid won't get uh, a boost in testosterone, but if it's low, um, it does it can accelerate that that rebound. Well, that typically, that's back. actually the direction that most doctors, like a hormone therapist, if you were like, let's say your your free test is like two hundred range or whatever, they, they typically will, which which would be low. Yes, would be low. Like you're at your your free range is three hundred to twelve hundred range, right? Is kind of the what they would say is normal. Normal, yeah. And, which is obviously there's a large range there, but typically people fall in there. Um, and if you're down below that, that's kind of the first, that's actually the first place they'll go. A hormone therapist will first go. And then number two, what HCG they, probably wait, they'll, they'll first go to something like Clomid. Clomid. Yes. Bef- yeah. Before giving you testosterone. Yeah. Okay. They, they'll try to do it that Jump way. Start your body's yeah, uh, system. They'll, they'll try and do it that way first. And then if it's not bumping you into the, the normal range and it depends, like I've had different hormone therapists that I've met and talked with and, you know, because this is, it's kind of a newer industry really it hasn't been, it hasn't been around that long and. So different doctors are, are uh, more stringent than others as far as what they'll do, how they'll dose or what they will offer or what they'll tell you you should take. But it really doesn't take that much synthetic testosterone to get you into that normal that normal world. I mean, most bodybuilders, you know, we're, we're taking cycles that are much larger than that. But that's a lot of uh, what I was when I got into it and, you know, started competing. Uh, that's kind of like most of the bodybuilders. That's what they they typically just focus on. You know, like that's what another thing where right? I talked about what I enjoy. They, they typically just focus on the, the, the hormones, just the hormones, how, how okay. much and how much more this can Chemically I take enhancing themselves. Yeah. You know, instead okay. of we, we talk a lot about program design and nutrition and the importance of all that, where, you know, a lot of the locker room talk is, you know, what do you want? And, you know, how much how many grams of this mm-hmm. are you taking? And what are you taking mm-hmm. after this It's cycles? It's what, more what do they call it gear. Yeah, gear. Yeah, yeah gear. How what much gear, gear? What gear are you on? Yeah, what gear are you yeah. on? What are you taking? And this is why you look at their routines, uh, and they look the same. I mean, yeah. you look at bodybuilding routines, and their workouts are almost identical. It's the really? same yeah. body part split. You start with the compound movement, move it's to your finishers, copy. get a pump. Nothing really um, groundbreaking with uh, program design. If you want to see good program design, you got to go strength athletes, Olympic lifters, power lifters. Or old-time bodybuilders. You know, if you go back before the introduction of steroids, 
bodybuilders worked out very yeah, different. The guys in the back of Mad Magazine. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you look at like the older team with, with, with the with what 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 are those kind of dumbbells that were they were they round? They look like balloons on either end of the. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. the yeah. old school hoisting those old timey. Oh man, yeah. but those, they had some incredible feats of strength. Doing bent presses oh, and stuff. Timey. Yeah. <laughs> feats of strength. Yeah. <laughs> Twist your mustache on the side and you're exactly. And you're good they, to go. they 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 come up onto the circus stage right after the girl who rides with with one foot on on a horse. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> two horses exactly. Yeah. So, so program design, the, these old school guys, what were they doing? So old, the old school. So this is interesting. Um, the, old, the old timey, old timey bodybuilder. So, um, a while back, uh, when I, so I developed a program, um, and then we worked on some subsequent ones, uh, called maps and MAP stands for muscular adaptation programming system. And some of the basis of that was studying the old time strongman and bodybuilder routines. Cause I, I found that I saw that they were very different. You know, the old time strongman and bodybuilders trained full body three days a week. Mm -hmm. They trained movement much more than muscle. So it wasn't like they were like, I'm hammering my bicep or my tricep. It was like, I'm pulling in this direction or I'm pushing in that direction. Mm. And these guys, you know, this is before creatine and protein powders were incredible. They looked incredible, but their feats of strength were mind blowing. I mean, you're talking about like Eugene Sandow bent pressing. I don't know if you know what a bent press is. It's a one arm Kind of side bend, almost looks not, like a not, windmill. Not a bench press, a bent press. Bent right. press. This is a one arm technical press. It's almost like a windmill yeah. movement with three hundred pounds in one arm, and this is a barbell. It's a long barbell. So these these feet. So you're like pressing the weight overhead and kind of bending your body to get under right. the weight yeah. with rotation. Yeah, yeah. I and, think I've seen this picture. And it's in, it's uh, the the feats of it's strength awesome were incredible. Move. The the muscle that they built, especially for the time, was incredible, and their workouts were very different. They did full body workouts. How do you know? Uh, because they had them all written down, and oh, really? uh, some of them even sold workout uh, plans, so you could really? buy them and see these old timey, you know, uh, barbell dumbbell workout or whatever. Um, and there were some muscle magazines back then that would publish some of the workouts. And I'm now, now I'm talking a little later, you know, the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Okay. Um, but they didn't train to failure. They did train intensely. But they did a lot of frequency. So, you know, whereas a bodybuilder today may hit chest once a week really hard and hammer the hell out of it, they would do a, some kind of a chest movement three or four days a week. Uh, they wouldn't go completely to failure. And they, you know, got great results. And so I played with this type of, you know, programming on myself and on clients. And I was blown away. Blown did away you, by the results. Wear, did you wear the, the leopard skin? I did. That was <laughs> yeah, part yeah, of the... Right. <laughs> that was part the, the of the... Tarzan. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But I was blown away by it. Well, so. that was the, this is also the evolution of the trigger sessions, too, which is a concept that, uh, you know, Sal came up with with the original maps, which is instead of just hammering the body every single time, is getting these uh, low doses of frequency of just sending that anabolic signal to the muscle, so... How how were they getting a good anabolic muscle growth signal without training to failure? So so this is a this is an interesting um, and this is a very good question. It's interesting because the muscle building community has hammered home the fact that you need to go to failure in order to send uh, a muscle building signal. But there's lots of factors that you want to consider when you're trying to build muscle. One of them is are you sending the signal, and then number two. Are you teaching your body to adapt or are you simply wanting your body to recover each time? Because recovery and adaptation can be two different things. Your body can simply want to heal from damage. And you see a lot of people like this, right? They go to the gym and they get really sore. They beat themselves up, mm -hmm. but there's no progress. They're not adapting. All their body's doing is healing. Heal, beat down, heal, beat down. What you want is you want adaptation. And for anybody who wants evidence of muscle building without failure... Um, look at, uh, go look at a plumber's forearms or a mechanic's forearms, or go look at somebody who does hard labor. They don't train extremely intense at all. They've been doing it for years and yet they, their muscles start to develop from this low levels of frequent stimulation. Yeah. But I mean, like when I'm, you know, when I'm working on a, I'll, I'll admit I work on a bicycle more than I work on a car or, you know, when I'm, sure. when I'm screwing something to a wall here in my house, like I'll, I'll screw and screw and screw the, the screwdriver, for example, and my forearms get to the point where they just can't go anymore. Sure. And then I have to stop and then start up again or yell at my wife about where the, <laughs> where the, uh, where the automatic screw driver is the, <laughs> the drill uh but it, that's not considered to be failure um it's that's different i mean that's fatigue i don't know if necessarily that you would call that failure okay but um i think uh, and what i found with training because you know between the three of us we've probably trained i don't know thousands of clients um going to failure for most people is more intensity than is necessary and the thing with getting the body to adapt is you want to send the signal but you don't want to go beyond 
what is necessary because now you're tapping into the body's ability to recover. And, you know, studies will show that muscle building signal lasts for about 48 to 72 hours. So if I hit my legs super hard to failure, hammer the crap out of them on Monday, by Wednesday, even even though I'm still sore and I'm still recovering, that 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 you know that protein synthesis signal, that muscle building signal, fades quite a bit. And so it makes sense to hit it again to send that signal again. And rather than sending one super loud muscle building signal and then let it dampen until the next time you work out, send one that's intense. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a hard workout, but not to that quite to that point. But you hit these peaks more often throughout the week, and you and you build more muscle. And it's pretty crazy at how effective that simple philosophy is. So you'd go full body. Let's, let's say, for example, if you're going to do like, like kind of like the old timey, I want to build strength yes. routine without spending copious amounts of time in the gym doing, you know, eight different types of exercises for my biceps. Correct. I'm going to go full body three days a week, but I'm not going to go to fail. I'm going to push hard, but not go to complete failure. We always say stop now, about two reps two, short of failure. Would, would that be like, what if you just decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do, and I want to ask you like an example of what a full body workout would be mm-hmm. here in a second, but would that mean maybe you're going to go do your workout without say a spotter or somebody to help you out and just mm-hmm. basically decide, okay, once my own body isn't able to do it anymore, that's when I stop. No. So you would, so it takes, uh, when someone starts training this way, it usually takes a few weeks for them to get in tune with what that means for their body, but it's really, the, two, it's really the breaking down of the form. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, when, at that moment when you, when once you, you start, start to know, when you once start to biomechanics fatigue. starts to suffer. Right? Yeah. Once okay. it starts to really suffer and you think to yourself, like I could squeeze out maybe two more reps yeah. and then collapse, you should stop before. So you stop one or two reps short of that. Okay. Um, and then you're able to hit the body more frequently as a result. Okay. So walk me through what, what a typical routine would look like if I, if I were going to, Go into the gym and use one of these old timey routines, or or like you. Uh, what did you say? MAP stands for uh, Muscular Adaptation Programming System, and that's kind of like your adaptation of, of some of these things that you found when studying. Yes, and there's a lot there's a lot to the program. But if okay. you, if you were to do a very basic uh, uh, rundown of a full body routine, very very simple. Uh, first off, you'd want to if you're looking for maximum muscle gain and strength, you'd want to focus on the big compound movements, right? Your squats, your your rows, your pull ups, your deadlifts, your you know overhead press, overhead press that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. You want to do maybe one or two exercises per body part, maybe three sets each, um, and start with the big body parts and go to the small ones. So a, a workout, you know, a typical workout would be like barbell squat to, and then a bench press, and then either a pull up or a row, an overhead press, maybe a bicep or tricep exercise, something for your for your core and something for your calves if you want to, and that's it. And then you're done. And then you do, you know you, you rest on Tuesday or whatever, and you go Wednesday and, and you do something very similar, maybe change it up. So rather than doing a back squat, you might do a front squat. Or you may do a deadlift or some other hip movement. To start you with. forgot the part about the old time you putting in the vinyl record. Yeah. That's true. Um, so, so on the in between days, mm-hmm. were these guys really just sitting around? Because we were talking last night about like Dan John. Great you know, I, question. I interviewed Dan John. And he's like, dude, like watch wow. watch college football games and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> in between, you know, three days a, a week, full body workout, and you're going to get swole. But in my opinion, you know, for cardiovascular health and perhaps even boosting recovery and lymph flow and blood flow and everything else. You know, I'm a bigger fan of like, you know, sauna and, and mm-hmm, yoga and mm-hmm. active and recovery and stuff like that in the off days. What do you do on the yeah. off days? So you have, so a couple of things to consider too. When you look at guys that are just guys and girls that are just big muscular people, many times, uh, the information they're going to give you may, it's probably not going to work for you or for most people because these people tend to be genetically gifted. Their bodies respond very, very, very well to resistance training. So they can hammer the bodies, relax, uh, hammer the bodies, relax, eat peanut butter jelly sandwiches, like you said, and they'll build muscle. Whereas a lot of us may not build as much muscle or we may gain body fat as a result of you know resting and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So that's one thing to consider. But active recovery is superior to uh, just, just, just resting. Now, just resting is important too, but if you're just you run of the mill sore, you know, if I worked out my legs uh, and yesterday and they're a little bit sore today, one of the best things I could do is move them again with some low-level intensity the following day. It facilitates recovery. It actually sends a very small muscle-building signal, or at least it keeps the one that you sent the day before elevated. 
And so this this act of recovery is extremely important. Uh, what do you, when it what comes do you mean to, it sends a muscle building signal? So let's say you like again, like you worked out yesterday very, very hard. You sent this loud signal to your body to build muscle. Right? I did one of these like full body routines you've described. Yes. Okay. The following day, that signal will start to drop a little bit. And they find they show again, like I said, 72 hours usually it's 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 down to almost baseline. If the next day I do some low level activity, and this is the concept of trigger sessions that we put in, in the MAPS program. If I do some low-level activity the next day, target those muscles, hit them with low intensity, get a little bit of a pump, a little bit of a burn, it facilitates recovery, but it also keeps that muscle-building signal loud and clear versus resting and letting that signal start to dampen. And uh, again, you know, here's a great example. I, if I took two people or two groups of people and one group of people, I had them do squats very heavily and, and then the following days I had them walk and stretch and do light body weight lunges. And the other group of people, they hammered their legs and then they just bed rest for the rest of the week. Just lay in bed and don't move. The people in bed rest would lose muscle. They'd lose muscle and strength mm. within a five-day, seven-day period, even shorter. I mean, all of us have experienced that where we had to lay down and you know, not move or have a cast on for a short period of time. You lose muscle very, very quickly. So that activity, uh, you know, the following you know, days, even though it's not the same high-intensity tear up your muscles type activity, definitely contributes to adaptation. It's important. Well, what do they what do they say? I think the studies say that it's after after three three days or so of of recovery from training, it, a, atrophy already begins. That, yeah. So yeah, I mean the body yeah. the body wants to recover, but it doesn't always want to build. It's it's not hard to to make yourself to, to damage muscle. That's right. That's that's e- that's easy. Any right. idiot can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what about the use of, this is something I've heard, for example, Dr. Rhonda Patrick talk about the, the, uh, muscle maintenance, uh, effect of something like heat, right? Like the, Mm. the heat shock protein response and some of the other, uh, I guess like muscle maintenance effects of doing something like, uh, like sauna and, and, uh, heat on the off days. Excellent question. So with heat shock proteins, uh, to elevate those, it actually, you, you need a lot, you need a lot of heat you need a lot of exposure, um, but there's some theories out there saying that it could um, help with building muscle with recovery. Um, my theory on it is this. Uh, when it comes to things like extreme temperatures, cold and heat and hot, um, it's a stress on the body. And, and if there's one thing that I've learned over the years, it's that uh, stress applied to the body appropriately will elicit uh, an adaptation response um, that the body and the body's basically trying to get stronger or, mm-hmm. or tougher, yeah. if you will. Hormesis, right? It, exactly. Yeah. So if I go out and uh, if I go in a sauna too long, uh, I'll exhaust my body's ability to adapt um, and to recover, and yeah. I can damage myself. You run out of magazines too. It, exactly. But if I use heat appropriately and elicit that adaptation response, um, and over time work my way up, just like you do with exercise. Um, you'll get some you'll get some adaptations that are favorable to making you stronger and healthier. And there's cultures that have used heat and cold for oh, thousands yeah. of years. I know yeah. for myself, I've recently been using sauna and steam room regularly, and I never have before. Mm-hmm. And evidence of the adaptation is my my heat tolerance is dramatically better. Like I can go out in the sun. I mean, we live in California; it gets pretty hot there. I, I can handle the sun way better than I could before. And I, I mean, that's, that's a form of adaptation. Something happened. Yeah. No, I, I do it almost every day now. And I, I, well, I, I sweat more. I'm able to handle the heat more and uh, vascularity goes up too. So you get an increase. You get that vasodilation. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a few crossover benefits. Do you ever bed, alternate bedroom. with cold? Uh, what I do with, with my sauna practice is I'll do the infrared sauna because the infrared sauna takes a really long time to kind of like heat the sauna up. And then I'll finish up 30 to 40 minutes of that with, uh, I don't know if you guys are running around outside earlier and you saw that. Did you guys see the pool house? Yeah, uh, we did. Yeah. yeah. So that, that pool is at 55 degrees. Oh, so nice. I'll, I'll go out there and jump in that and do like hypoxic underwater swimming mm. responsibly. No shallow water blackout. Can you explain hypoxic uh, breathing for us? To so, us? so normally, hy- like really good hypoxic training to allow for that big increase in nitric oxide thin- synthase and also an activation of what's called your mammalian dive reflex, right? So you get a little bit of vagal nerve tone. Normally, you'd be looking at holding your breath until it's pretty uncomfortable, right? You're getting some diaphragmatic contractions like the 
Yeah, you want to swallow water. Right, exactly. And then you come up for breath and you recover and you do it again. And you'd preferably want to do that with a partner just in case you did have shallow water blackout. Mm. Uh, what I do is kind of like the baby version of that. So I actually swim back and forth under the water until I feel like I probably should come up for a breath. But before those diaphragmatic contractions begin mm. and I just go back and forth for about five to ten minutes, you know, coming up for a breath when I need to. And it's very therapeutic. You, you do like, this post sauna, you do the sauna and then, and then head over there. Yeah, You feel like you're in mommy's womb, right? Yeah. <laughs> like a little baby. So, and, and there's something very therapeutic about water. It's really interesting. And then I get out and I, I don't, uh, I don't get back in the heat. I just allow myself to, to air dry. So my body has to generate some heat, you know, get some of that brown fat conversion, the adipose tissue to brown fat conversion to, to activate the metabolically active fat and heat up. But when I am doing a normal dry sauna protocol, because the dry sauna heats you up faster than the infrared sauna does, I'll go dry sauna to cold shower or cold plunge, back to dry sauna mm-hmm. to cold. And that's one of the one of the, the best ways, in my opinion, to get over jet lag, like when you're traveling a lot, is I'll Google name of the city that I'm in or name of the hotel that I'm staying at, plus the word sauna, or use like the Google Maps find near here, and I'll find a sauna and just go do sauna to cold plunge, sauna to cold plunge. Uh, Japanese saunas, Turkish saunas, and Russian saunas all typically tend to have a cold pool or one of those little cold showers where, like the old school cold showers where you pull the handle, oh. right, and the water comes out. It's just like this big. <laughs> that's ball shrinking when you pull it. Yeah, yeah but, but that's effect. that's the way that I do the the, uh, the hot cold. Have so, you have you messed with cryo at all? Have you done cryotherapy at all? Yeah, there's there's one down the street from my house, um, and I like it, but I like water. I mean, the, cryotherapy is nice because you don't have to get wet, right? right. You can and just it's quick, put your right? clothes back on. Always back to back, right? So so you do the three minutes that they'll let you do. And then you have them measure your skin temperature and you want the skin temp to get back up to, I think it's 170 and then they'll let you back in. If you do back to back three minute sessions, you get a way better cold thermal response. Like like 10 minutes later, I'll be driving down the street and just shivering, but I still like water, Mm -hmm. you know, because water, like I mentioned that dive reflex, it activates that you get the actual compression of the water, compression of the cold against the skin. And from what I understand, that actually deactivates some of the lymph fluid backflow that can occur when you are doing cold without compression. So cold for recovery should be accompanied by compression mm. in an ideal scenario. And so, wanna, so like massage, <clears throat> would you say? Uh, what do you mean? For compression? Uh, massa- no, what you would do, for example, is you would get compression gear and put ice packs underneath the compression then, gear, or you would use water and and you would get in the water and and the 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 pressure from the actual water, the hydrostatic pressure from the water forces the cold up against the muscle. Now, I would imagine the cold water would probably stimulate that wanting to breathe effect even that's, more because I get that from a cold yeah, shower. That's what you're looking for, for vagal nerve tone, which yeah. you, which you can increase through you know, freaking like chanting, singing, gargling. There's all sorts of weird things. Justin like gargles. That I do that. Yeah. <laughs> big, big gargling. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, since, since you are into, uh, into the, the, the whole muscle building thing and, and we kind of, we kind of went down that Avenue a little bit. You mentioned the word triggering mm-hmm. and I, I wanted to actually ask you what you meant by that. That like the, the, what do you, what do you mean when you say triggering? So a trigger session, uh, or triggering. So triggering the, the term triggering in the context that we use it is basically, you're triggering a, a signal uh, to tell the body to adapt in some way. So in, in this particular uh, case, we're talking about building muscle. So lifting heavy weights intensely triggers a muscle building adaptation or strength building adaptation. You know, running long distances would trigger adaptation, improve endurance. So that's that's the term triggering. But trigger sessions are something that is very unique to uh, some of the programs that we've created. And the concept behind trigger sessions is on the off days, and I'm doing the air quotes here, on the days that you're not in the gym lifting heavy weight, you are doing short five to 10 minute trigger sessions throughout the day, up to three a day of targeted exercises. So uh, if you have a particular area that you want to work on, let's say you want to work on your mid back or your shoulders, you could target those a little more specifically. What I like to do and what I tend to advocate is a whole body trigger session because I'm trying to, again, facilitate re- recovery and maintain that muscle building signal or keep it elevated uh, from the workout that I did the day before. It's very low intensity. All you're aiming for is a little bit of a burn, a little bit of a pump in the muscles. Um, I recommend using bands because bands cause less damage typically yeah, than, than uh, free weights would. 
Um, body weight is okay, uh, if but you have to be careful. Some people don't have the ability to recover from body weight trigger sessions. Uh, you know, you definitely would. I use them all the time, but beginners, I always recommend bands. Um, and so you do this several times a day. So what you're doing essentially is you're getting a little pump, uh, you know, in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. And uh, real short too. You're only so, so I could keep like a band next to my desk yes. for for the days that I'm not doing this full body three day a week routine, and I could do like well, like some some presses, some twists, exactly some squats, exactly just basic full body movements, but not to failure. Just like light stuff. To just get, get a little bit of a burn, a little bit moderate. of pump, exactly, and. Hmm. Uh, what you notice is you recover faster, you build muscle faster, you burn fat faster. Oh, your energy too. You, you made a comment about the way you feel when you come out of the sauna. That's how I feel after a trigger session, right? Right yeah. after you get a little five, 10 minute, just that light pump. Charges like that. you up. It is. It's a nice little charge and surge of energy. Think of also, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're at a very advanced level. Think about how you can train recruitment patterns. Think about how you can train. Like if you're, you know, you're trying to get a very you know, efficient recruitment pattern for a particular mm-hmm. movement, like a press, like you have an issue packing your shoulder or, you know, elevating your, your, your press to, to lock out. What a great way to use a trigger session. This is typically how I use them because like I'm working more on skills. Like say I'm working on my overhead press or I'm working like specifically just on improving my squat depth or something like that. I could actually right. focus on that more on those days with lightweight, but really, you know, work on enhancing that technique. Yeah. Got it. Cool. By the way, I think that's one of the first times that, that you've talked so far. <laughs> you awesome. guys ran the show. That's, that's hard when we've got yeah. four guys podcasting. So yeah. it's, Sal, well, it's Sal and Adam have been talking a lot. Justin, yeah. not so much. This is you guys are talking man. about like yeah. like hormones and all that. You can have that. Yeah. You, you guys, you guys <laughs> yeah. are visiting. I'm not into that. You guys are visiting from from San Jose. Yeah. You can't mm-hmm. Spokane. You'll be here a few days. We'll hopefully go and, and see the uh, see the Proving Ground fights tonight maybe and, yeah. and go go have a good time. But, uh, uh, when you are on the road like this, how do things change for you? Like as far as your workouts go, are you all body weight hotel room style workouts or do you uh, guys have any, any unique little twists that you do when you travel that you think folks should know about? Sal's probably the most anal. Wouldn't you say Justin? Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Sal, Sal, was Sal the only guy who actually worked yeah, out? This he is. He is the only guy. I worked out right before I got on the plane. So that was like, you know, I had to make sure I established that, but yeah, if it's only a couple of days, typically I don't sweat it too hard. So yeah, I feel, I feel like, uh, when we get a chance to do something like this, this is, uh, this is fun for me. You know, we're up somewhere where I've never been before. get a chance to hang out with you and uh, even though my workouts and fitness is a priority, that's why we have a program that's called Maps Anywhere, where I can do it with my bands inside a hotel room. So, and I have them with me. I brought them, but uh, it it becomes less of a priority for me when it's a short trip like this. If we were here for four or five days, I'm, I'm right. not I'm not going to take. I'll definitely have a plan. So at that I, point. Mm-hmm. so I drove up right. So I've, I've I've made this kind of part of a little vacation. This is kind of the end of it. Oh, you drove here? I drove. I yeah. Know. So I I uh, did some kayaking in, in Lake Tahoe. Went to Crater Lake. Stopped in Portland, Seattle. Now here, and I brought kettlebells with me, um, and a about a five foot long uh, stick. So I can do tension movements with the stick, mm-hmm. do kettlebell movements, and then at the hotels that I'm at, if they have a gym, I'll do workouts. Uh, what, what do you mean, and, a stick? Uh, literally that dowel. So, are you familiar with like stick mobility and, and tension? Oh, you mean like a, like a broomstick? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Not, not like a Johnny Appleseed walking stick. No, 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 not you that. You could use it. Right? Little yeah. Leaves you, and stuff. No, you could there. use that. Yeah, We're but old timey training. But I'll do like old. tension movements on it. Um, kettlebell exercises, and I try and do thirty to forty five minutes every single day. Um, and when I go back to my regular workouts, um, many times, not only have I not lost any performance, many times I've gained performance just because it's different. You know. Yeah. And you're probably a little bit rested and recovered. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean that's. I think that's part of it. Maybe eating yeah. more on, yeah. on the road. Well, that's I true. find, and I'm curious if you're like this. Typically, when I find guys like us that that are so passionate about what we do, that if I ever do anything, it's normally overtraining. It's normally not letting my body rest, not letting myself recover. So I kind of use these type of trips as that excuse to like. Hey, you know what? Let's focus on business. Let's enjoy company. Let's kind of rest a little bit. Because mm-hmm. when I'm home, I'm you know not to your extent and level, but I'm constantly experimenting with my body and ha- hammering it on right. this and trying that all the time that you know it's- yeah you make me sound like a freak dude there's, <laughs> trust me, there's nothing shoved up my ass or, or in my i was showing you guys my little nose dildo earlier my little uh, laser, laser laser light for my nose um yeah what i what totally i tend normal. to find myself doing when i'm traveling especially when i know i'm going to be at like a conference where you're you wake up in the morning you want to work out but it doesn't happen because somebody invited you to breakfast and then the conference yeah. goes all day and then you're planning on working out in the evening but it turns out there's a cocktail hour so you don't make it to that mm-hmm. like my my strategy is i just i smash it before i go yep. right so yeah. so then you use that 
that for your recovery. And, you know, so I'll, I'll take, I'll take one day before I'll go to like a conference and I'll, that'll be a double day, right? Where I'll do like a two a day, hard morning, hard evening so, workout. You show up, you recover. And then when you come back, you're, you're fitter a lot of times cause you've super compensated. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's exactly how I think I, I mean, I had a heavy, heavy deadlifting and squatting day right before I came yep. up here and I'm still sore from it. So I'm yeah. like, that's the way I look at yeah. it. Yeah. So like, um, four, four, four big muscular guys in my house last night and my wife had a tiny bowl of chicken i think i told her there were i, I told there were either two or three of you but but either way um the chicken actually didn't disappear that quickly you guys were, were pretty responsible you did manage to polish off yeah. a, a couple bottles you of organic wine yeah. um but dude usually i'll see guys like you just like uh, on, honestly the last time i was in dubai for example i went out with a couple of crossfitters over there and literally, I think they ordered all the beef tartare and everybody had a whole chicken, like a whole freaking chicken with like, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? like a whole cooked protein's chicken. the holy grail, because, right? Because protein. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is it with you guys and protein? Cause, cause I, I didn't get the impression that you were, you were protein holics, like a lot of the bigger guys I've seen. No, like anything in bodybuilding, they'll take something that's got some merit and then they, they apply the whole more, oh, if this much is good, more is that much better which is not true with anything. I don't care what it is. And it's not true with protein either. Protein uh, intake, um, the best studies that we have will show an upper limit of benefit from about, I don't know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Um, the guys yeah, now- 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams per per pound. Per pound of okay. body weight, yeah. So so less than a one-to-one -one ratio. So less than a one-to-one -one ratio. 150-pound female, you don't need 150 50 grams of protein. No, right? any, any, and what happens, I mean, any more, I mean, of course you can eat one gram per pound of body weight. You can eat a little bit more. Is it good for you? Maybe not in the long term. Is it going to give you lots of negative side effects? Maybe not. Probably not. Um, is it going to give you any benefit? No. Um, I think you're, you're missing out on a lot of the benefits of fats, healthy fats, and maybe even carbohydrates for carbohydrate consuming. What about athletes. like, what about like the aging effect of protein or like ammonia buildup, that kind of stuff? Do you, do you guys focus on that at all? Or, you know, when, in, when looking at protein too much, the thing that worries me is this, um, very, very high protein diets have been have been loosely connected to increased risks of cancer. Um, it does stimulate the mTOR. Um, gene uh, at a very high level, which as we know, helps build muscle, but also can cause cancer growth. So that's the big one for me. It's, you know, eating that, eating tons and tons of protein all the time consistently, you're probably not doing yourself uh, any benefit. On top of that, um, these bodybuilders will advocate, you know, two grams per pound. So, of oh, some of them are doing, or two some of my half. peers are doing three. So like that, three. that's like, that's move like product, almost man. three times as much as what you guys would recommend. If you're a, yes. let's say you're a 200 pound male, that would be eating 400 to 500 grams of protein every single day and you you know a, many it, of them eat like this many of them eat like this and you have to you know you it's hard to get that with whole foods so then you end up going over to the process right you're getting bars and you're getting shakes and all this artificial stuff well so. that's why it's been pushed it's been pushed and uh, as as truth because the businesses and companies that run the fitness industry are supplement companies and they know if they tell you to eat you know if you're a 150 pound female and they're telling you to eat 300 grams of protein a day there's no way in hell you're going to eat 300 grams of food. Yeah, good luck protein. to like eight to 10 chicken yeah. breasts for a girl. Yeah, you're going to be taking, you know, four shakes a day. So that it just benefits them uh, to promote this myth. Um, a relatively high protein diet, probably safe uh, for the, the kidneys, which filter protein. A super high protein diet, there's no science. There's no studies showing two and a half, three grams of protein per pound of body weight over the course of five to 10 years is safe. Yeah. And it's probably not. Yeah. It's probably not good for you. There's the idea about aging too, right? Like a like a protein restricted modified fasting diet appears to uh from what I understand like decrease Increase the longevity. Rate of which, yeah, decrease mm -hmm. uh the telomere shortening. I think intermittent I know intermittent fasting um uh, protein restriction definitely calorie restriction in general. Intermittent fasting gives you a lot of those benefits as well. So if you're an athlete that likes to consume the amount of protein to maximize performance, which again um, is probably around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams per pound, still high protein, but nowhere near what we just talked about. Um, you can get a lot of the longevity benefits uh, from some of these studies by simply incorporating fasting, even when you're trying to bulk. And I even say, especially when you're trying to bulk or you're eating excess calories, it's a good idea to throw that fasting day in there. Um, as a matter of fact, we sell a fasting guide. I think we're the only three you know, bodybuilder yeah, type meathead dudes. guys that talk about don't that, eat, don't eat. Yeah, that, 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 that will promote fasting that. Guy, that must have been easy to write. Very easy. Just, just, just don't eat this don't eat, day. I had a great commercial for yeah. it. It's like, yeah, all you got to do is not eat. Yeah, don't yeah. eat. It's crazy. But Skip you, you would, you'd be surprised. People, I think, 
think that fasting means don't eat and then eat garbage or don't eat, you know, for, you know, there, there's different methods uh, of, mm. uh, of using fasting. Wear, wear a toga, go to the desert, meditate. That's the real way to do it. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Legit. scorpion. Yeah, right? That's the yeah. legit way to do it. But yeah, if you, uh, you know, if you fast properly, um, it will also improve your sensitivity to protein. So you may not mm. need as much protein as you think. Mm-hmm. Uh, your body just may be become inefficient at using it because you eat so much of it all the time. You know, and redu- reducing it sometimes might be good. Well, I really noticed a lot when, when I switched over. So I went ketogenic about uh, six months uh, for the first time ever. Um, and my the biggest takeaway that I had from it, because I still enjoy my carbs, I don't need a, a full-blown ketogenic diet now, was it just changed my relationship with carbohydrates and with fats. Uh, mm. For so many years as trainers, I mean, we've demonized fat. And I mean, I remember telling clients like, oh, don't, don't, don't even try and get fat in your diet. You know, when I, when I first started 15 years ago, especially like, saturated yeah. fat, watch out broccoli, chicken, and rice, right? Yeah. I, I mean, not that, very much of the six rice. times a day, yeah. by the way. Yeah. yeah that was, that was kind of, that right. was the prescription. And, uh, you know, I was, I used to, and I, I remember when we first talked about it and I was like, why would I ever want to do that? I eat four to 600 grams of carbs and I can still stay lean. I love that, you know, which allows me mm-hmm. all this flexibility and freedom. But when I when I started to replace all the carbohydrates with uh, fat and reduce, it just I could feel my skin, my hair, my sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't lose strength. I didn't lose energy like I thought. Um, mm-hmm. I noticed too that now when I would reintroduce carbohydrates, the responsiveness of my body. Mm-hmm. Now when I would have fifty grams of carbs, I would I would feel those surges. Where before that was just I was eating seventy five to one hundred in almost every meal. And that was just the norm. And, uh, you know, I really started to notice the difference. I could feel it when I went. So, you know, even though I'm not a full blown ketogenic person right now, and I still incorporate carbohydrates in my diet, I, uh, I see the huge benefits behind that. And we, this is the type of stuff that we talk about. And it's just, we knew that we would be outside the norm being these meathead guys. You know, normally when guys look at us right away, how they dare just, you label us like that? Right. But most yeah. people, most people do when they, when yeah. they, they see us, they, you know, you're pretty meat heady, like <laughs> facial hair, a little bit of facial hair, yeah. a little bit, a little bit of a neck beard going on over there. We got the traps, <laughs> sleeve tattoos. My best quality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you're a relatively muscular guy, especially for being an endurance quote unquote endurance uh, athlete. How is your protein yeah. intake? Because if anybody needs to eat um, higher protein, believe it or not, it's probably endurance athletes. I would yeah, say. no, that, that's interesting. You should ask. I'm actually at about zero point seven grams per pound mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. in that range. Now, so, do you keep it so consistent? Like, like right? around around twenty three percent. But but here's the deal. Like I don't freaking count. Like I'd, and everybody thinks that about me being like the self quantification biohacking guy that I'm using like chronometer dot com or some special <laughs> app to count everything. I really like aside from taking my heart rate variability every morning, I don't quantify that much at all. Hmm. I just I you guys were at dinner last night. My wife puts out the the chicken and the buckwheat wraps and the vegetables from the garden and I eat that. Uh, Lord knows I'm not fasted this morning because I just went out to the garden and you know threw a crap ton of vegetables in the smoothie and some coconut oil and and made myself a smoothie. And I have no clue how many carbs were in that or how much fat and the coconut oil. Literally, don't tell my wife I told you this, but I just stick my fingers in there and grab a gob of it and <laughs> throw it into the it's, throw it's it in am- the blender and you know I, I don't count. It's amazing though when you when you eat like that though intuitively when you're just making good healthy choices you don't really have to people are blown away with the same with me because I don't pay attention I don't, when I'm getting ready for a show totally different when I have to take myself to an unhealthy place and get to two three percent body fat then it takes the trip which I'm sure you did the same thing too when you competed you probably did track and count but the rest of the year like who wants to live like that I don't you know I want to be able to have a dinner with you and not be like hold on let me pull out my my app real the quick. Macros. <laughs> what are the macros? Yeah. Oh, don't Chicken. be that guy. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, I want to ask you guys, uh, I want to do the whole cheesy round table, ask a cool question towards the end of the podcast thing. Um, so, so make it good guys. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, no pressure. and, uh, and I know this might be tough to be, be relatively Spartan esque on, but what's the biggest lie or the biggest myth or the biggest mistruth in the fitness industry that you want to debunk right here, right now that maybe you think flies under the radar. Oh, so ooh, there's so many. Uh, well, the, one, not, not something like not eating for four weeks is going to put you into starvation mode, but. I don't know. Some something maybe folks haven't heard of, or something that that's really near and dear to your heart. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that I think going kind of in that direction of that, I th- there's this big fear of if we don't get food, 
uh, for a certain amount of time that uh, our body lose gains. Our body's just going to start metabolizing muscle, mm -hmm. and I don't think a lot of people realize that the body does not want to do that. Start peeing out your biceps. Yes, <laughs> it, people really feel this fear of I've, as soon as I get done with my workout, I got to get within yeah, the twenty minute anabolic shaking, window. Man. I got to get the shake in. My God, made Jamba Juice and health books. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I think that's probably the biggest one that I and I, I because maybe this is where I, I deal a lot with this with bodybuilding competing the six pack bags or bags everyone's carrying around their food and it's so crucial to get it in when they don't realize how <laughs> six pack bags tried to sponsor my show and I, I told <laughs> like, have them you that listened they, to my show yeah huh? no I, I told them I'm like I don't carry food barely ever because I eat when it when it comes in handy and otherwise I'm just going a long period of time between meals, including my workout. Well, I think you, and I was, I don't know if it was dinner. You, you mentioned this, or maybe it was one of the, the interviews I was listening to you do, but you, you did, you mentioned that like an example, like when we travel, a lot of times I'll just not eat. Right. Right. You know, I just won't eat for a while. We're like, like, okay with that. And yeah. it's, and I don't come back home with 10 pounds less muscle on me. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I feel great, you know? And, yeah. and I think that's the big thing that we like to, to really debunk is that you can be very muscular. You can, you know, be strong. You can be all these things. And you don't have to be stuffing your face with food all the time. Well, and everybody wants flexibility. Talk about the ultimate flexibility when you can just say, well, I don't have to eat right now. Like, it's not like I have to venture out and find this very specific restaurant right now to fit my needs. Like I can actually yeah. go without it. Honestly, I do. That's it. like going, going uh, ketogenic on international flights, right? Like that's one of the Good best. Good luck. <laughs> you just don't eat, right? Yeah. You just sit there, you watch your movie, you drink some water. And dude, it it's, it's, it simplifies life too. It does. Yeah, it, sure. it, there's so much less stress right. when you because if I ever hear anybody complain like in in the competing world or people that are so focused on their aesthetics is, oh my god, I gotta get, I gotta get here. We gotta go pull yeah. over and go get this or do that. Like mm -hmm. why? Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, you know how much more benefit you would get actually from just not doing that. You'll get more benefits if you actually probably skip this meal. Take We've been the gas station stop for the beef jerky and yeah. macadamia nuts so you yeah. can stay swole. Right. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying we're you're, you're you're sedentary anyways. Your body is not needing very much fuel right now. There's no mm -hmm. need to go fuel it. There's yeah. And so I think that's something that we we try to press. I try to talk a lot about that. You know, you can be buff and you don't got to eat all the time. In fact, I think that's gotten us as a, just as a population in general in a lot of trouble. I think that's what. Yeah. You know, we're, we're just a bunch of carb addicts, man. Right. We are yeah. just addicted to the sugar and that instant, that instant rush of carbohydrates. And you don't really, it's not essential. Mm -hmm. Carbs aren't, yeah. you know, we yeah. don't necessarily need them. So uh, that wasn't very Spartan ask, but <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Sal, Sal, biggest myth, uh, biggest myth. He covered, we covered protein intake. We, we covered frequent eating being a myth. Um, I think, uh, in the muscle building world, one of the biggest myths is that, um, in order to build, uh, particular body parts, especially the arms and the legs, that um, uh, single joint exercises do them great when, in fact, you probably never need to do a curl again if you do really good pull-ups and rows. Sell my preacher curl bench on Craigslist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Waste your time. Yeah. That, that, that would be the biggest one. Yeah. Focus on uh, movement and skill and then focus on muscle, not the other way around. Look, yeah. Learn how to get good at movements and you'll build all the muscle you want. Yeah. More. It's like my, my underground go-to exercise for bigger biceps. I, I, I don't know if you guys saw the keg in my garage. I carry, <laughs> yeah. I carry it my, one of my go-to workouts. I carry that around my house 10 times. Wow. Do you really? So you just set it down in between, do some mobility exercises, pick mm, it back up, mm -hmm. carry it around. Well, here's something yeah. I noticed, not, to go, not to go off topic, but you have uh, very muscular forearms and hands. And this, uh, aside from being very attractive, I just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I masturbate a lot with, with both, both hands. I was going to say you switch hands. Wow, double mm -hmm. pumper, huh? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at people who have uh, what I like to call real world strength, that's what you always notice is yeah. their hands right. and their forearms because that's what connects you to the world. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of guys and girls who are very muscular, weak hands, weak forearms. Not very good carryover to the real world. They can't do it. They can't grab anything. You're not using wrist wraps, right? Can't, can't milk a goat for longer than a minute. No, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Is that All what right. you call it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what you call it, man. No, I actually have goats, and I can't. Oh, okay. I do milk, but oh, I, we saw I, them. I, I, we'll I mean that, too. Yeah. Uh, Justin. Yeah, so I, I think for me, it's, it's really just the, the over-intensity factor, uh, being an athlete and, and coming from that background. Um, just, just always wanting to, um, exceed and, and get to that max exertion. That was always just my focus. Whereas, mm. you know, maybe, uh, doing that, you know, in, in spurts and, and planning it out better where I do that maybe three times a week, but I'm doing a low to moderate day in between. That was like earth shattering for me. So, um, just, you don't have to crawl out of the gym after you don't have that. to beat yourself up so hard to, yeah. to get what you want. Like there's a way to adapt and, and, 
and train your body to get better results without you're having to hammer yourself. You're destroying everybody's Pukey the Clown murals. Yeah. <laughs> I will take a dump on Pukey the Clown. How about that? <laughs> yeah. And that will be the title of today's podcast. Okay. Yeah. I love it. How to take a dump on yeah. Pukey the Clown. Take that. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for coming up. Um, Appreciate you I'm, having us. I'm looking forward to, to getting to know you more, to, to uh, giving a few listens to the Mind Pump podcast. So it's just, awesome. is it mindpump.com? Mindpumpmedia.com. Yeah. Mind pump me- mm-hmm. What's my? What will happen if you go to mindpump? If you go- if you literally <laughs> Google mind pump, though, we'll, we'll the internet will explode probably. If, if you uh, BenGreenfield.com used to be literally some guy. I'm totally not kidding. Bent over, right, wearing a pair of shorty shorts, and up right above him it said Enter BenGreenfield.com. Like, <laughs> like it was that bad. No way. I think it's changed since then, but it just it, it was my bane for a while. That, that's oh why my I God, that, No, we, that's amazing. No, but. Mind Pump Media is similar. Now you just go. It's got all of our <laughs> programs on there, and it breaks down uh, the show, talks a little bit about us, our show, very informative. Um, it's also comedy. We're also in the comedy category. Is it's it? very raw. It's very old timey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, don't listen to yuck, what gets uh, around because it's a little uh, explicit. Yeah, we've been but coined a as the Howard Stern of fitness. So, yeah. but don't worry, we're gonna get you on there real soon here. And I uh, think so. Mm-hmm. Give you a really a little bit there, buddy. <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> yeah. I'm game. I'll bring my Howard Stern wig. Exactly. Right in there with you guys. Hey, thanks for coming on, you guys. Thanks, man. Right, right, appreciate fun, it. Man. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.